Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 219. Jealousy. Yes, we are jumping into the muck this week. We're getting in the muck, we're swimming around a bit and hopefully getting you out of the muck once more because this is part of our comma series. So these are moments that we need to experience and understand and develop strategies to get out of rather than sit in and fester. So yes, jealousy, this is the biggie. And it matters a great deal in our universities because jealousy can destroy an individual's life, which is sad enough, but it can also destroy research projects and indeed dent the entire reputation of an institution. So let me explain how we got here. This matters a great deal. I'll just give you a, a quick personal example. So I had applied for and achieved, had actually been offered the post for a top end of town, very posh university, professorial post and dean. And I had a very good mate of mine that I'd known for 20 years who was working in this particular department. And after I had got the offer, I wrote to him. And I said, look mate, I've got this job. Can you tell me, what do you think about it? What do you think about this job? What's this like as a place to work? And he got back in touch with me immediately and said, do not accept this job. It is a toxic environment. Everybody hates each other and anybody who is successful, they all swarm on that person and stab them in the back. I'm trying to get out. Don't come. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, because I trust this man and I've known him for 20 years, I refused that job and he was out of the institution three months later. But the challenge we have right now in international higher education is that jobs are hard to come by. So if you get a job, even if you know the environment's a bit L wonky, you're going to have to accept that job and manage somehow. And of course, jealousy is a crucial variable to understand and manage in international higher education. So I wanna go straight into jealousy and I wanna start with two stories involving PhD students and jealousy. And these will rock your socks. Now these stories are separated by 20 years. They are slightly different and the outcomes are slightly different, but they are still resonant. So at the cusp of the year 2000, there were, sounds like a fairy tale, I used to think comfortably, at the cusp of the 2000s, there were two PhD students. They were both young women. And one had had a truly brilliant research career so far. It got a great grade point average, first class honours, had gone to a terribly posh, fabulous bohemian school, had fantastically fashionable parents, everything was going well. So got first class honours, got a scholarship and enrolled in the PhD. And at the same time, in the same research cohort or cluster, another lass had emerged. She'd had a sort of pretty mediocre bachelor degree, had done a coursework master's program, was a country girl, had gone to a country high school and her parents had struggled to get their kids even through high school. So these two became fast friends. So they started at the same time, and as you do in a PhD program, they became fast friends. And everything went tremendously well between these women for two whole years. Then something happened. The scholarship holder, the high achiever, in the second year, moving to the third, all of a sudden plateaued. The research was sort of okay, not spectacular, but okay good solid thesis, she was teaching, she was an okay teacher, but again, nothing terribly magnificent in terms of her past and her brilliant past. It sort of had fizzled out a bit. And what had happened to that other woman? Well, the last without a scholarship, when she was given a chance and support, she was simply flying. Her thesis was magnificent. There were publications everywhere, they were going well. She was an absolutely incredible teacher. So this was just absolutely terrific. So through the second and the third year, this relationship became incredibly strained. The non-scholarship holder still loved her friend deeply and couldn't really understand why she was going cold on her. 
and the scholarship holder, the high achiever, well, she started to distance herself from her friend, from the research cohort, and from her supervisor. And she then proceeded to undermine this young woman at every possible opportunity that she had. Now, the non-scholarship holder finished in three years, went on to a fantastic career, great teacher, great researcher, everything brilliant. The high achiever took five extra months. So her PhD took three years and five months. And in the final five months, she only wrote a 6,000 word introduction that was pretty mediocre. So that was put out to examiners. It was okay, they sort of liked it. Major corrections, major corrections made. But can I say this last, never published a word from that thesis, made the corrections, graduated from the degree, but never contacted any of her fellow students again and never contacted her supervisor again. She disappeared. First story. Second story comes 20 years later from again two PhD students and again two women. Now the research shows interestingly enough that Jealousy is mainly deployed by men. So all the quant studies that have been done show that it is men that use jealousy. Now I know that seems counterintuitive and indeed through my experience it's been women that have used this ability trope method and we'll talk about why that is today and, in, and indeed in our vlog next week but the research shows it's mainly men. In my experience it's mainly women. So again we're back to two women here two female PhD students, right? So of these two PhD students, one was a high achiever, had been a high achiever throughout her entire career, university medalist, every success, got a scholarship. The other had a bit of a gap between an undergraduate degree and her honours degree and her PhD, so it was all a bit patchy, no clear disciplinary path, so she sort of stumbled into a PhD program as happens. But of course, as always happens in a PhD, these two women started at the same time and became fast friends. But this time, a bit different from my earlier story, these two were competitive right from the start. The high achiever spent a lot of time complaining, a lot of time talking, rather than a lot of time reading and researching. Lots of gossip, lots of gossip, rather than writing. And the non-standard entry into the PhD, that lass, she worked a bit hard, but a lot of her time was spent poking and probing the high achiever, getting her going, unsettling her, making her self-conscious, making her doubt herself. So both of them, and you see this sometimes, both of them were what I call players. They turned the attacks on each other rather than focus on their thesis and their achievement it all became about their stuff right so the high achiever during her PhD just simply did not work hard enough because she was fixated on the achievements and the research of the other woman and she produced a mediocre thesis in four years and then left the university never to be seen again the other woman though didn't get away unscathed, as in my last story. And indeed, she produced, again, a pretty mediocre thesis in four years, but she continued to be a player, continuing to think that those strategies she'd used against that lass in the PhD would work. But of course, we're in a casualised, precariat university environment, and if someone's a bit of a player, no one cares terribly much because she's of no use to anybody. So what these two stories show us, I think, is that jealousy is going to knock you out. It's going to block your career, block your collaborations and relationships with other people, and no one will want to work with you. If you get a reputation for being this jealous, nasty, better work, uh, people will just simply walk away from the situation. So today, as always, we're going to talk about the nature of jealousy, how it operates in our universities, and then we've got five really big, really deep strategies this week to manage it. There's no easy fix to jealousy because people orient their entire lives in and through jealousy. So we've got to really change someone's entire life and orientation to make this work. 
So of all the comma series that I've brought to you through this weird, wonderful time on planet Earth, jealousy has the patchiest literature. So this has been the most weird of the literature that I've read. And look, I've read more on sexual jealousy in the last six weeks than I will ever humanly need. But we see lots of pretty dreadful material about personal relationships, romantic relationships, friendships, but workplace jealousy is only a small part of the literature. And then in that literature, university jealousy is even smaller. It's amazing for something that's so big, and most of us have got 50 stories about this. And if for something that clearly is so important in universities, it's very, very silent. So I've taken some literature, there's a couple of books, a lot of blogs talking about it, and also higher education studies and the workplace. I also wanted to log a fabulous article written by a dear friend of mine, J. Daniel Thompson, published in the Chronicle of Higher Education in 2017. And this was a great article. My respects to Jay. You're a wonderful human. And the title was a, a ripper too, quote, maybe you're just a jealous academic. So put that into Google and you'll see Jay's work. But Jay argued that jealousy was simply the marinade of academic contexts. And what he conveyed was a huge amount of bitterness always attends academic jealousy. So Jay's done us a favor there. Bitterness, rage, anger is part of academic jealousy. But what else constitutes it? Well, jealousy is a clustering of thoughts, a clustering of feelings that express fear, anxiety, or a lack. Jealousy emerges in human relationships. Jealousy is a product of a context. It's not rational, it's not logical, it is a reading of a context. In fact, I would argue a misreading of a context. But what happens is through the misreading of that context, there's a flawed interpretation that results in really, really problematic actions. So there are multiple modes through which jealousy is expressed. There's no singular emotion. There are no singular sets of behaviors. It involves possessiveness, either a fear of losing or the coveting of what somebody else has. Behaviors include denial, distancing, disconnection, violent communication and threats. That's well dodgy, but also, oh yeah, manipulation. This behavior is profoundly destructive to a range of academic behaviors. Academic jealousy will knock you out. It will end your career because it takes time away from reading, away from research. It instigates a complete blockage to your writing and actually blocks the collegiality that creates the collaboration that builds your research in the first place. Also, your self-worth is diminished. But in a competitive job market, such as what we have at the moment, both outside and inside our universities, there are clear expectations on a prospective worker. There is a demand, because we can pick anybody. If I'm hiring somebody, I've got tens of thousands of people around the world to pick from. So what I'm after is very clear. I want someone who is honest, who has an authentic sense of self, focused on completing tasks, and also comfortable in their own skin. Because success in universities is absolutely about hard work. It's about hard, hard work. This is a hard job hard work. It's also though about timing and it's about luck and you've got to have all three. Therefore putting the entirety of your identity on success within a university <laughs> in these times is handing over your happiness and your success to other people. And of course that action is the breeding ground for jealousy. Because if you place your entire life, your entire happiness in the hands of others, the chances are you're going to lose. And the reason is 
you're going to lose because you lack. Because instead of addressing the lack in yourself, getting yourself cool, you're trying to nick those attributes of other people. And people will pick that. So if you have a life, family, friends, if you have leisure, you have multiple fonts of pleasure and identity in your life, then that's going to give you balance rather than this all or nothing plan involving I will have an academic job or I will have nothing. If that's your binary opposition, you are lining yourself up for failure instead of looking at that failure in the mirror, you're going to blame other people through jealousy. You see where this is going? So jealousy gives away your power. So you want profile, bless you. You want success, you want popularity that this other person supposedly is enjoying. And of course, social media only makes this stuff worse because supposedly all these people around you on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, they're sort of oversharing their profound successes. So when you scroll down Instagram, all these people have got, <laughs> have got a terribly successful life, except obviously you. And this of course leads us to some very difficult questions on this beautiful morning. How do you handle other people's success? How do you handle your friends' successes? What is amazing, I think, is that something that's so common, that is academic jealousy, is so rarely talked about honestly, like I'm doing today. And I think there is an explanation for that, because we're really working through a precarious period for university employment. It's casualized, it's contract, and it appears really, really cutthroat, because it is. The competition is absolutely dreadful, and it's nasty. So in many ways, academic jealousy at this point is human, and it is completely understandable. But the problem we've got, and why we needed to have this moment in our comma series, is jealousy, <laughs> ironically, actually blocks the behaviours that you're going to need to be successful. Think about those two stories that started the vlog today. Jealousy is actually going to stop the development of your career. It will knock you out of the competition. And the reason, well, I'm going to use that cliche again, a football cliche, you're playing the man you're not playing the ball. Also, you're focusing all your time, all your effort, all your energy on another person, not your research. Time is finite. You are dead a long time. So use the time well. Read, write, research, work hard, work hard. Every minute, if you're involved in what other people are thinking and doing and achieving, every minute, that's a minute you're not doing your research. So if you want to be successful, you have to enact the behaviours to be successful. Focusing on other people is the exact opposite of what you need for a successful career. And also, of course, sorry to tell the yucky truths, but that's the job in, the, in this comma series, I think, is successful people don't want to be anywhere near you <laughs> if you are behaving in this way. If you're nasty, if you're showing envy, if you're behaving dreadfully, people will kick you to the curb because people want to be near. They want to work with positive, interesting, clever, intellectually generous people. Now, they're the people that are hired because they are a pleasure to work with and a pleasure to work for. And for me, every time, the moment in an interview where resentment emerges or a blaming of other people for your staff, better anger, any time that stuff bubbles through an interview and I will ask questions to try and get it to bubble, that person is gone. You will not be hired because people, all of us have worked with colleagues like that and we never ever want to work with them again so you won't be hired. So focus today on what you believe is the imperative or the goal of your life. What do you want to achieve? What do you want? What is 
your goal. Now, the problem emerges when I ask that question, what's your goal? When the answer, if someone's answering honestly, their answer is, I want recognition. <laughs> I want to be recognized. Now, of course, recognition requires that other people notice you. In other words, you've released your power, your autonomy, your agency, your identity to what other people think of you. And that is the path to madness because you do not have control over what other people think of you. You only have control over what you think of you. So now, hard yakker, eh? Let's now move to the five steps, the five stages, the five strategies, the five tropes to move you away from jealousy, to transform it into a comma and get moving. Let's do this. One. You are not better than anyone. And no one's better than you. I'm always stunned, to be honest, absolutely stunned on a daily basis when I hear people explain to me how incredibly important they are. <laughs> I have thousands, I have a book, I actually keep a book to be honest with you, I have a book, an exercise book, where whatever happens during the day, the delusions that people have expressed to me through the day, I come home and I write them in a book and I've done that for 20 years about the really odd stuff that happens in academic life. One day I'll write a fiction novel, one day I will. And uh, let's give you some examples. So my personal favorite is, I was talking with a professor and he was explaining to me that he couldn't select an independent examiner for a student. He couldn't pick a proper international independent academic because, quote, there are three, quote, there are only three experts in this field in the world I am one of them, and I know the other two. Fantastic, bless. Uh, my other favourite, happened recently, is a student with some anger explained to me that she needed to see her supervisor every single day. I need to see my supervisor every day because I'm paying for this degree. Needless to say, she was confusing undergraduate fee structures with a PhD fee structure, because of course in Australia, uh, domestic students don't pay fees. The Australian taxpayer is paying your fees, so you're not paying fees at all. Uh, and seeing your supervisor once a week, that's plenty. So another great example is, and this one happens a lot, can I say, a student sends a draft to a supervisor on a Sunday night, and they are disgusted that the supervisor hasn't read that draft by the meeting on, you've guessed it, Monday morning. There are thousands of examples like this from academic life where disrespect and delusions emerge from grandeur, from this fantasy, this dream of a person's importance. Now there are reasons this sort of stuff particularly emerges in academic life and that is because we as academics, we live in our head a lot. We live up here most of the time. And look, all sorts of narratives <laughs> are going on in an academic's mind about we're, how we're the star of our own lives and we're terribly important and our research is terribly significant, yes. Now, look, confidence is incredibly important. You have to believe in yourself, you have to believe in your research and you've got to back yourself. That's not even in question. But, and this is a huge but, huge but, you are not better, you are not greater than any other human on planet Earth. Full stop. Just because you're in a PhD program doesn't mean that you are better or greater than the millions of people, billions of people on this planet that have never had the opportunities that you've been given. So if you see yourself as better than others, if you see your needs as more important than others, then when life starts to present bills to you, which it will, then what will happen? Resentment, confusion, and of course, 
jealousy. Because after all, you think you're better than everybody else, so why would this be happening to you? And of course, this is the condition for jealousy towards others. Because, yeah, you have not developed the personal and the professional resources to understand that other people's needs are just as important as your own. Now, your supervisor has many students, and you know what? They have a family, and they have a right to spend time with that family. Similarly for academics, who run that fantastically magnificent narrative that there are only three experts in the world, I'm one of them, and I'm mates with the other two. Bless you, because that shows to me immediately that you don't read widely, that you run in very, very closed and small academic circles, and of course that that person will be overtaken very quickly. Because what we see when that sort of stuff emerges from an academic is elitism and racism. Because what it means is those academics are only looking for excellence in a particular package from a particular type of university, from particular journals, and of course, from particular nations. Needless to say, brilliance, intelligence and innovation comes in many different packages. And that's why, for example, I'll try not to get upset, that's why, for example, when a scholar of colour gains success, all these white whispers of pro-discrimination start to emerge. And of course, this is a form of jealousy. A closed, selfish white scholar who supposedly knows all the great scholars in the world, who are similarly, of course, closed and white, can't work out how a brilliant person of colour got that job. Mm. So when jealousy runs through the lens of racism, it just makes a really bad situation even worse. And of course, this is the hardest one to address because the whole culture really appears to want you to be self-absorbed, inward and nasty. That can be changed if you just live with the mantra, you are not better than anyone else and no one's better than you. Two, move from jealousy to generosity. You do not need to own, control, judge, rule. You don't have to rule and control to gain meaning in your life. Supporting others, showing compassion, listening, understanding colleagues, understanding peers, all of that provides a stable foundation for learning, for meeting new people, and creating really amazing and meaningful relationships. Now, some of the deepest friendships you'll make in your life come during your PhD program and when you are an early career researcher. Nurture them. And let me share something with you that amazes me every single day. What happens is when you spend time on nurturing and building those friendships, when you care for a group of people throughout your academic career, something odd happens. By my age, <laughs> those people who you shared, all those terribly dodgy jobs, the dreadful bosses, the hard, hard yakka, the teaching eight, nine courses a semester, the really tough stuff. Those people that you live that with, right? All of a sudden, that cohort, that group of people are suddenly senior. <laughs> no one's more surprised than me. Uh, and we're all suddenly in positions of power. This group of lifelong friends can, and trust me, we are supporting each other 
to get great jobs, get great grants, move through publishing, move through life with greater skill. Because all those gatekeepers that have held us back for so long, they're retiring. <laughs> yeah. So remember, in this corporatized, ruthless, international higher education system, this system wants you, wants you to hate colleagues, be angry, be nasty, get competitive, kill each other. The system wants you to do that. They want you to treat every committee like Game of Thrones, Red Wedding. <coughs> but actually what no one tells you is that you win the game of higher education by critiquing this nonsense. You'll have to fight it, but there'll be fantastic rewards if you can. And I'll just quote the wonderful Simon Winlow, Professor Simon Winlow. He stated, quote, vapid careerism is endemic, an inevitable outcome given the aggressive marketization of the university and the dumbing down of politics and culture. And contemporary academic careers are now forged in the white heat of competition, end of quote. Simon, you are an inspiration to us all. Simon is right, and we do have to fight this culture. And the weird thing is, you fight this aggressive culture through gentle skills, through soft power, friendship, trust, kindness, intellectual generosity. And all of this transforms this agro-fueled competition into a destructive end game that will destroy those parties. If you wanted to kill each other, let them kill each other. But the weirdest thing is, in the long term, supporting your academic colleagues enables your career. Three. Know yourself, accept yourself. Now I know the five strategies we're deploying this week in Jealousy, these are long terms. These aren't tips and tricks like do this today and you'll feel better. This stuff is hard yakka because if jealousy is blood in your veins, we're gonna to have to give you a blood transfusion, right? So this is deep, no quick fixes here. But what we're trying to do is move your energy and move your focus from how other people have had achievements to the work that you are doing to enable your outcomes. So we're trying to move you from focusing on other people to focusing on yourself, your portfolio of efforts and work, your portfolio of success. And all of this movement, and you've got to pull it, pull your attention away from others to your work every day. Now, all of this starts with knowing yourself and accepting yourself. <laughs> you are enough. You are enough. And you are where you need to be right now. This is so important, you know, because academic jealousy begins and it ends with you comparing yourself to other people. So you're going to knock yourself out of every single job opportunity that comes up if you continue to compare yourself to other people. Because what happens is you look at that, that other person, oh they're better than me, oh jealousy, and you become intimidated and you've lost the job before you even start the interview. So wish everybody well, hope you go well, hope you have a great day, good luck. I've always done this with interviews, by the way. In England, they always put the shortlisted people in the same room. So you meet each other at the start of the day. And always from that experience, I wish them well. I hope it goes well for you. Whoever they want, I hope the best person gets the job. Good luck. And I mean it. I really mean it going in. Everybody gives it their best shot. And whoever wins, that's great. Wish them well. And that's whether we're talking about a successful PhD, getting that grant, getting that article, getting that job. Wish them well. Do the best you can. Focus on your game. And at its most basic, what we're trying to do is set your own standard. What are your standards rather than continually moving it about via the competition? What matters to you? Who are you? Four. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
focus on collaboration, not status management. <laughs> leaders and leadership, leaders exist everywhere. Leadership is not determined by a title, and leadership is not determined by where you park your car. But if we wish to create cultural change in our universities, and yes, we do need it, if we wish to create a space where we critique academic jealousy, then the people who operate with decency need to be acknowledged, supported, hired, and promoted. But the reason why in our history universities have continued to hire the nasty, the bullying and the toxic is because much of our culture in universities in the last 20 years particularly has been based on status management. The look at me, I'm fantastic, look at me, look I'm fabulous, I'm just fabulous. So these people, yeah, so they're the people that have got hired. Status management rather than the authentic deep collaborations that are created between people of integrity because that takes a bit of time and that takes a bit of intelligence so to further this project about academic integrity rather than status management i recommend the great book from daniel coyle to you daniel daniel coyle the culture code a fine book the culture code really enjoyed it so what happened was Coyle conducted a research project and demonstrated that the organisations interested in status management spent their time working out who was in charge, <laughs> hesitating to offer a commentary on a project in case they upset the person who is in charge. And of course all of this stuff, all this energy looking at status management simply created inefficiency and unproductive competition. Whereas the projects and the teams based around collaboration were the most creative, the most innovative and the most successful. So why were those groups successful? Now hang on to yourself. In these groups, everyone felt safe. So what made a great collaboration? Safety. They felt cared for. They felt appreciated. They produced more. They were more innovative. And they were more efficient. So, if you're focused on status management, your title, the type of car you drive, how posh you are, you're not going to produce high quality work. Yeah, bye. If you start with relationships and invest in the relationships, creating safety rather than status, you'll be successful. How about that? So think about how our world would change if every single day we go to university with the goal of creating safe spaces. Everyone has a voice, everyone has value, and there's no hierarchy. Coyle described the best leaders, and of course leadership is very different from management, let me tell you, but Coyle described the greatest leaders as the people who pick up the trash. The greatest leaders pick up the trash. Nothing is below them. So find those people, find those groups, support those people, stay with those people, be loyal to those people. Those people will allow you to be successful and allow everybody to be successful. Safety. Five, think, don't react. Think, don't react. If I could change anything about the universe, if I was a wizard, and trust me, I would love to be a wizard, I have the hat, but it doesn't work. But if I was a wizard, then I would stop people reacting 
with emotion. I would stop the reaction. I would ask that people have a feeling, have a think, have a cup of coffee, take a breath, have a bit of a reflection, and then decide not to send an email about how much they hate somebody. You've heard me through however many hundreds of these vlogs talk about universities as being a workplace. I never used to do that, you know. Ten years ago, I never used to describe the university as a workplace because I had higher aspirations for us. I wanted us to be better than that. A place of innovation and ideas and great thinkers and great thoughts. And we're not that. We're a workplace. It is just like working for Ford. And that's okay, that's where we are. The university is a workplace, we are working for four. That's the deal. We have much more in common now with other workplaces than we ever had throughout our history. And of course, I'm pretty comfortable with that. Okay, universities are a workplace. They're not religious organizations. They're not your family. They're not your friends. Therefore, the standards of professionalism, civility, and employment law and regulation are now key to this story. This means if you have a thought, if you have a feeling about a fellow student or your supervisor, say you despise your supervisor, you hate your supervisor, you hate someone in the lab and you use that sort of language then look, that's really sad for you. That's really sad. But that's a feeling. It's not real. And it's not appropriate for you to express that feeling in a workplace. Now remember, I'm not talking about abuse or bullying or rudeness. They have to be called every time in the vlog next week. We're going there, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But just because you don't like somebody, that is irrelevant. This is a workplace. This is a workplace. So develop some strategies to sort out your reactions. So stop moving the destructive thoughts into destructive actions. You do not have the right to send out an email that ruins somebody's night somebody's day, somebody's week, or somebody's job. You don't have that right. Remember, I have worked with colleagues that have killed themselves because of, because of the drip, 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 drip of destructive emails. Just because you have a feeling or a reaction does not mean you have the right to share it. Sort yourself out. If you've got a problem with somebody else, that's your problem. That's not their problem. That's your problem. Instead, congratulate other people on their success and mean it, mean it. And if other people's success has an edge for you, then learn from that and use it as a personal motivator so that you work harder. So really, this is where we're dealing with the medication for intellectual jealousy. Create a new habit. Something great happens, congratulate somebody, mean it, and then move back to your work. Jealousy, you know, it only has two functions. It isolates you and it increases your anxiety. So, Stop coming to relationships
finding fault. Acknowledge moments of tension, speak the words, but tolerate that other people are different from you. But further, don't just tolerate difference, celebrate it, love the difference, because innovation, brilliance, comes from difference. It doesn't come from standardization. Other people can't solve your problems, but you can. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea and the wizard and the dragon out. <laughs>